Right, here's a combined physics higher. It's paper one. Now these are Edexcel past paper questions, but these questions will be similar to the questions you get on any exam board because all exam boards assess waves. For the Edexcel scheme of work, this is what we'll call SP4. Now these questions have been taken from a number of different papers over the last few years and you can see there's 33 marks worth of questions up for grabs. Right, let's get started. Question 1. A student investigates what happens when light travels from air to glass. So it's light and it's going from air to glass. Yeah, here's your typical picture. In figure 2, angle Y is the angle of... Oh, well, it's the angle of refraction. That's an easy question. You'll see this question again and again as I go over this paper. So that proves that they use the same questions every year. So by practicing the past papers before you go into the exam, you'll increase your success in the exam. Simple as that. Part two. Figure three is a graph of the student's results. So angle Y up the side, angle X along the bottom, both in degrees. Use the graph to calculate the value for angle Y divided by angle X. Right, you can pick any values from the graph. As long as they correspond to each other, obviously. So if I say when angle Y is 10, that means that angle X, all right, that's, hang on, so 10 up to 20, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 boxes, so each box is 2. So that's 2, 4, and half a box, so that's another 1, that's 5, so that's 15. So angle Y, I've said that was 10 degrees, and angle X, the corresponding value of X was 15, so 10 over 15, and that's 0 0.6 recurring. Part 3. The student concludes that angle Y is directly proportional to angle X. Explain what the student must do to test this conclusion in more detail. Well, directly proportional means if one angle doubles, the other angle doubles, and it goes through 0, 0. 0, 0 gets called the origin. Now, you'll not actually get any marks for what I've said down there, I'm just telling you. <laughs> right, I mean, let's have a look then. What must the student do to test the conclusion? Right, well, look, they've only took two results, so that's a bit pathetic, isn't it? They need to take more results at greater angles and then repeat it. And it's worth three marks, so that'll get you the three. Question two. A different water wave has a wavelength of 0.25 metres and a frequency of 1.5 hertz. Calculate the wave speed. So the wave speed equals frequency times by wavelength. So we'll pop the numbers in. Frequency is 1.5 hertz. Wavelength is 0 0.25 meters. And that comes out as 0 0.375. And they've got the units there, so we don't need to put the units. Question 3. A sound wave travels with a velocity of 1,530 meters a second. The frequency of the wave is 1.2 kilohertz. Calculate the wavelength. So this question here, question two, that would have been on a different paper compared to question three. So you can see they've used very similar questions year after year. The only thing they've done here is they've been sneaky. 1.2 kilohertz, so that's 1.2 
times 10 to the 3 hertz. We've got to make sure we get rid of the kilohertz. Remember, kilo means 1,000, so that's times 10 to the 3. Calculate the wavelength this time. Now, if V equals F times by lambda, so frequency times by wavelength, I keep saying to my students, you've got to learn to rearrange these equations. So rearrange the equation to get the wavelength. So wavelength equals the speed over the frequency. So pop the numbers in. And that equals 1.275 meters. Question four. A class is learning about refraction of waves. So remember, refraction just means when waves bend. The teacher shows them a demonstration using a battery-powered toy car travelling across a smooth road and then into some sand. The car slows down as it enters the sand. Figure 7 shows the car just before it meets the sand. Draw an arrow on the diagram to show the direction of the car as it travels across the sand. Right, so best thing to do is to draw a normal, which is a dotted line, at 90 degrees to the boundary. Now, if the car is going to slow down, I don't know if you've saw one of my other videos where I talk about fast. Faster away, slower toward. Now, this tells us that the car slows down. So if the car is going to get slower, it's going to move toward the normal. So, so instead of coming straight up here, it's actually going to bend toward the normal, just like that. And there you go. That'll get you one mark. Explain why this is a useful model for refraction of light. Right, well, light slows down when it enters a more dense material. And as it does, it bends toward the normal. And that's exactly what the car did. So the car behaves like light. Question five. Sound travels slower in air than it does in water. So this is a similar question again. Right, but be careful though. They're talking about sound now, which does behave oppositely to light. Sound travels slower in air than it does in water. Figure nine shows the direction of travel of a sound wave approaching a boundary between air and water. The sound wave refracts at the boundary between air and water. Complete the diagram in figure 9 to show the direction the sound wave travels in the air. Right, so sound travels slower in air than it does in water. So it's going through water, so it's moving fast, and then as it gets into the air, it's going to move slow. Well, as I've just said before, let's use our acronym FAST. If the wave gets faster, it moves away from the normal. And if the wave gets slower, it moves toward the normal. So it's going to get slower and it's going to move toward the normal. So if it didn't bend at all, it would go there on that path. But it's going to bend toward the normal. So it's going to bend up this way somewhere. How much? Well, it doesn't matter. Don't bend it right up there like that, though. The examiners need to see a little bit of an angle in here. And this angle here needs to be smaller than this angle here. And then that's how you can tell that it's bent toward the normal. Put your little arrow on as well, just in case. So it's always the same questions, isn't it? Right, question six. Figure eight shows a long metal rod and a hammer. The rod is hit at one end by the hammer. This causes a sound wave to travel along the inside of the metal rod. Describe how hitting the rod causes a sound wave to travel along the inside of the rod. Right, well inside the rod is all little particles, isn't it? 
And what happens is the particles start to vibrate more. And as they start to vibrate more, they collide into the particle that's next to them. And then they pass the energy on through vibrations. Now it's worth two marks. So the particles gain energy and vibrate more and pass energy onto the next particle. Question seven. The diagram in figure seven shows two students, P and Q, trying to measure the speed of sound in air. P, so this person, will clap his hands together. When Q, this person, sees P clap his hands, she will start a timer. When Q hears the clap, she will stop the timer. Right, so P is going to clap his hands. As soon as Q sees him clap his hands, start the stopwatch, and then the sound is going to travel, and then she's going to stop the stopwatch once she hears the sound. Now, she'll see the clap before she hears the sound, because light travels at 300 million meters a second so as soon as he claps his hands she's going to see it but sound only travels at about 330 meters a second so that's about a million times slower now explain one way the student could improve their method right well if sound travels at 330 meters a second which is much slower than light but it's still pretty fast it's not going to take long at all for sound to travel from P to Q. So how good are your reactions? I can't start and stop a stopwatch within split seconds accurately. So as soon as you've started the stopwatch, you're going to have to stop the stopwatch. So to improve their method, just literally get P and Q to stand further apart from each other. And then it'll give you a bit more time to start and then stop the stopwatch. So that'll reduce human error. I mean, another thing you could say is use a computer, but I don't know how you'd get the computer to see the person and then hear the sound. So I wouldn't say that for this particular question. I'd go with what I've said. Right, question eight. The speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters a second. That's what I've said. It's a three with eight nothings after it. So that's 300 million meters per second. The wavelength of yellow light is 5.8 times 10 to the minus seven, right? So I've got the speed, I've got the wavelength, and it says calculate the frequency of the yellow light and state the unit. Right, well, this is the third time that the same questions came up and they've even gave you the equation this time. So just pop the numbers in. So that's the speed divided by the wavelength. Now you'll have to make sure you know how to put that number in your calculator mind. And that equals 5.1724 times 10 to the 14. And if it's frequency, it's in Hertz. So the units are Hertz. And everything else was just a one decimal place. So I'm putting mine in one decimal place as well. 5.2 times 10 to the 14. I often get asked that, what's the correct number of significant figures or what's the correct number of decimal places? Well, just use the same as what they've used. So if they've used one decimal place, you use one decimal place. If one number was to one decimal place and the other one was to two decimal places, well, use the two decimal places. Use the number with the most number of decimal places. Question nine. Figure five shows lightning from a thunderstorm over the sea. Which row of the table is correct for the light and the sound wave? Right, well, light wave is transverse wave, goes up and down like that. And sound waves are the longitudinal waves where they've got compressions like this and rarefactions in the middle. So. Which one is it? Transverse and longitudinal. There you go, it's row C. 
Right, part two. The person on a beach hears the sound of thunder six seconds after seeing the lightning. Well, yeah, you would. Because remember, sound is like a million times slower than light. So you'll always see the flash first and then you'll hear the thunder afterwards. Unless, of course, you are right next to the storm because then you'll see the light and hear the thunder at the same time. The speed of the sound wave is 330 meters a second. The speed of light in air is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters a second. Estimate the distance between the lightning and the person. Right, this here is just what we call an ambiguous distractor. They've put, an, uh, they've put some extra information in there that you don't need. We just need the speed of sound and the time that the sound took to travel. So remember, speed equals distance over time. So therefore, we're after the distance. Distance equals speed times by time. So the speed is 330 meters a second. The time was six seconds. And that's 1,980 meters. Question 10. Sound travels slower in cold air than it does in warm air. The equation relating the speed of sound in air to the density of the air is this thing. So speed of sound equals k over the square root of density, where k is a constant. The table in figure 10 gives some data about the speed of sound in air and the density of air. Right, so it tells us in cold air what the speed was and what the density was. In warm air, doesn't tell us the speed, does tell us the density. Use the equation and the data in the table in figure 10 to calculate the speed of sound in warm air. So we need to calculate that. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. Right, well, that's one, two, three significant figures. That is one, two, three sig figs. And that is one, two, three sig figs. So we need to use three significant figures. Now, to calculate the speed, calculate the speed, we need to know k and we need to know density. Now, we've got the density in warm air but we do not have k. So what we need to do is you say to yourself, why have they gave you this information here, right? Well, you obviously need it, and we need it in order to calculate k. Because look, if we talk about cold air, we've got the speed of sound, so we've got the speed, and we've got the density as well. So basically, we can rearrange that equation and get k. So k is going to equal the speed of sound multiplied by the square root of density. So this is what I'm saying again. You need to know how to rearrange the equations. Now, if you're looking at that thing, and how did you do that? Right, look, just simplify it. Imagine that the speed of sound is letter a. Imagine that k is letter b, and imagine that the square root of density is letter c. What you've basically got is a equals b divided by c. And we want to get b, right? We want to get this k thing. We want to get b by itself, all right? So now, if you look at it like that, it looks so much easier, doesn't it? You know, so a times by c is going to equal b. Well, that's all that I've done here, all right? So the speed of sound was like a, and this square root of density thing was like c. So a times by c equals b. Right, <clears throat> enough waffle. Let's bang the numbers in. So the speed of sound in cold air was 331, and the corresponding density of the cold air is 1.29. So if we bang that into a calculator, we'll get value for k. So k is 375.94. Now I actually wouldn't round it up just yet. Because we're going to use this k value in a further calculation, I would write all that down. So that's our k value. Right, 
Now we need to go back to calculating the speed of sound for the warm air. So we'll just go back to using that equation. So the speed of sound equals k, which we now know is that number, 375. And we'll need to divide that by the square root of density. Well, the density for the warm air is 1.16. Bang that into your calculator. And that comes out as 349.05. Now, we said that we were going to do it to three significant figures. So we just need figure one, figure two, and figure three. So the answer is literally 349. I did take into account this number here, but obviously that's a zero. So the nine doesn't need to be rounded up. And the last question, question 11. Figure two is a diagram of a water wave. A cork is floating on the water. Right, so the direction of travel of the wave is going from left to right. Now that cork will be bobbing up and down if that's uh, floating on water. Part one. Use the scale on the diagram to measure the wavelength of the wave. Right, the wavelength of a wave is just from any position to the same position on the next wave. So we'll start from there, go all the way up, all the way down, and all the way back to there. So that is basically the wavelength from there to there. And that is 12. Make sure that the scale's not gonna catch you out. It's a really easy scale. Going from zero to five is just five squares. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five squares. So each square is just one. So that's 10, 11, 12, easy. Describe the motion of the cork. You should include how the cork moves relative to the direction of travel of the wave. Right, well, if it's floating on water, water is a transverse wave. And with a transverse wave, you've got the direction of travel is this way, and the vibrations are at 90 degrees to the direction of travel. Okay. So it's just your standard definition of a transverse wave. Make sure you know your definition of the longitudinal wave as well, mind, because that's a common question. Do you see how I've used the direction of travel of the wave? Because that's what they said up the top, direction of travel of the wave. Actually describe the motion of the cork. Vibrations are at 90 degrees. So you could see vibrations of the cork. You'll be fine just seeing without the cork, but just in case. And uh, yeah, I've put three things. It's only worth two. You'll definitely get two marks for what we've said there. Now, just in case it did say about longitudinal next time, in a longitudinal wave, the vibrations are parallel to the direction of travel. Now, this whole paper was 33 marks, so I should take anything up to 33 minutes in an exam to do it. Obviously, I've been teaching this for ages, so I can blast through it much quicker. Um, and also, I've been describing everything as, I, as I've gone through it. But honestly, by practicing some exams like this, you'll be able to absolutely rip through these exam papers, getting really good scores. So I'm going to keep bashing these videos out. So stay tuned uh, for the next video. Work hard, be nice, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now. Well, I hope the video helped you. Work hard, be nice, and bye for now.